How do you take a photo of a total solar eclipse? It may seem daunting, and you might not know where to start. But what if I told you that with a camera and a tiny bit of preparation, you can take great photos of an eclipse? I'll show you what you can use, what you should buy ahead of time, and the most important thing to do before this once-in-a-decade experience. Let's go back in time. This blob is a photo of my first total solar eclipse. What went wrong, and what have I done to try to prevent this from happening again? Let me tell you. Okay, let's take a step back. What makes a good photo of an eclipse? It should be clear and not blurry. There are two main ingredients that go into making a photo clear. The first is focus. Focus is somewhat straightforward. Cell phones and all modern cameras handle this for you. They can get confused, but we'll assume that the camera is handling focus for now. The other ingredient is light. Except for totality, taking a photo of the sun is like drinking from a fire hose. Trying to take a quick sip from the fire hose never works. The only way to make it safe is to greatly reduce the flow of light. For that, you need a special solar filter. The good thing is, they're not that expensive. If you don't have one, get one after you finish this video. Also, pick up some solar glasses while you're at it. They're inexpensive, and they allow you to view and photograph the sun without destroying your eyes or your camera. Links are in the description. Now, as an aside, you might think you might be able to use just any filter. Don't do it. There is light you can't see that can also hurt your eyes and camera. It's like a heat laser inside the water. Solar filters block this invisible light. Okay, the solar filter brought the light down from a fire hose to a garden hose, but can you drink from the garden hose? Yes, so long as there isn't too much or too little water, how thirsty you are, and so long as you're not too slow trying to drink from it. Not to stretch a metaphor or anything. This is similar to the balancing act of taking a photo. The camera can figure it out, but it might guess wrong, so you, sh so you should be aware of the three knobs the camera uses to take a photo. They're aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Aperture controls the light by physically varying the amount of light hitting the sensor. Shutter speed is how quickly the sensor looks at the light. If the shutter speed is too fast, you don't get enough light. If it's too slow, you might get too much light, or the light will move across the sensor, making for a blurry image. And finally, ISO is light sensitivity. Higher ISO makes the sensor more sensitive, but it can become grainy. Ironically, even though you're taking a photo of the sun, you can struggle to get enough light in the camera. And this becomes even more severe during totality. At this point, the fire hose of light from the sun stops. The invisible dangerous light is gone, and you must remove the solar filter. Now you're dealing with a fraction of the amount of light, and understanding the exposure knobs becomes very helpful, if not essential. We'll get to some things we can do during totality to maximize our chance of success later in the video. Here's a basic zoom lens with a solar filter. Let's take a photo of the sun. Okay, we can tell we're looking at the sun, but the sun is way too small in the frame. We need more power. We need a lens like this. This is a 150 to 600 millimeter Sigma zoom lens. It's not the most versatile lens, but for getting photos of the sun and moon close up, it's great. Of course, there are trade-offs. It's heavy and hard to point at the sun. You really need a tripod. Okay, so this is a huge improvement. If you hang a bag on the tripod, you can make a smaller tripod more stable. You just need to make sure everything is tight and you're not putting too much weight on the tripod. Also, when you push the shutter button, the whole setup will shake, which can result in a blurry photo. A quick way around this is to turn on the self-timer. On Canon cameras, you can set up two and 10 second timers. That way, when you push the shutter button, it waits a few seconds, which gives the camera shake time to stop. Or you can use an intervalometer like this. It also acts like a remote shutter release. Progress. We now have a crisp close-up of the sun. But we have another problem with the tripod. Because of the Earth's rotation, the sun will drift across the frame. Every two minutes, the sun moves its own width across the sky. If you were able to fill the picture with the sun, that means it would have moved out of the frame in two minutes. We aren't zoomed in that much, but it's still a problem. The partial phase of the eclipse lasts two hours, and totality will last four minutes. And we don't want to spend two hours babysitting the tripod. This is where tracking mounts come in. They will track the sun for us. Why don't you use a smart telescope like the Seastar S50? It's simple. You just... Turn it on, put on the solar filter, tell it to point at the sun, and you can take photos and video of the sun. It'll be good for the partial phase, maybe not so much for totality, but it's an idea.
Hush. Here are two different mounts. One is a star tracker and the other is a solar tracker, but either one will be useful during the eclipse. This lens doesn't have a quick release built in, so I have to add this plate to mount it to the tracker. Make sure the plate is secure. Since the lens weighs a lot, it will be pointing up at a strange angle and it might rotate. This plate has rubber pads on it, but the screw still can loosen and rotate. There are plates out there with a little stopper on it to prevent the rotation, but if you have a telephoto lens with a quick release plate built in, you probably don't have to worry about it. Starting with the star tracker, you can use this to take photos of the night sky, but it also has sun and moon modes. The reason for this is because the sun and moon move at slightly different speeds across the sky than stars. This is great, as it should theoretically keep the camera pointing directly at the sun for the entire length of the eclipse. Of course, things are never completely straightforward. The mount rotates around an axis, and that axis has to be pointed at a point in the sky you can't see during the day. Bummer. Now, if you're in the same place for the eclipse the day before, you, you could set up the mount the previous night and just make sure you don't touch it. Or you could just approximate it. There are two adjustments you need to make for the star tracker to work. The angle from the horizon and the compass direction it's pointing at. The angle is identical to your latitude. You can look that up online or in Google Maps. I'm at around 29 and a half degrees north, so I adjust this angle to just below 30 degrees. For the compass direction, the axis of the mount should point due north. On the iPhone, there is a compass app. You just want to make sure you have the true north setting turned on. Since most of our photos will be relatively quick, we shouldn't have any problems. However, you might want to recenter the sun periodically during the eclipse. Using the approximate alignment and then telling the mount it was pointed at the sun, the sun stayed centered for at least an hour on my first attempt. On my second attempt, it drifted a little bit. Of course, I might have just been lucky. This star tracker has a one star alignment mode and you can pick the sun. The results weren't too bad. This other mount is a sun tracker. It does what it says on the tin. It tracks the sun. Unfortunately, while this is super handy, it's also very limiting. It just tracks the sun. Besides the eclipse, this might not be that useful to you unless you plan on getting into solar astronomy. This tracker has a little camera and a GPS in it, so you just need to turn it on. Within a minute or so, it automatically points itself at the sun. This is almost a perfect solution. Remember that little tracking camera I mentioned? During totality, the sun disappears behind the moon. The tracker might start drifting a little because it isn't sure where the sun is. I did a little experiment where I covered up the camera and it didn't actually drift that much over about a 10 minute period, so it might actually be okay. During the partial phases, tracking the sun shouldn't be a problem. I used one in October for the partial solar eclipse. Okay, we're able to get a close-up of the sun. We're able to automatically follow the sun, but something's off. Maybe the sun's a bit bright or a bit dark. And what happens when we get to totality? Things move relatively slowly during the partial phases, but they speed up as you get closer to totality. It might seem like you can get away with the exposure being fully automated, especially at the start of the eclipse. If your photos are bright or dark, you can just adjust the exposure compensation. But the problem is the camera will probably get confused by the dark sky through the filter and the bright sun. Or as the sun gets smaller, like more of a crescent, it'll try to compensate. It's best just to set the exposure manually. The good thing is the same exposure will work through the entire partial phase of the eclipse. And you can practice that before the eclipse since the sun is essentially the same brightness. For extra safety, you should also consider shooting raw, which is just the raw photo off the sensor without any processing from the camera. It gives you more flexibility to correct the exposures after the fact. I personally always shoot JPEG plus raw mode the only real downside is you'll fill up memory cards a lot faster, but it gives you more flexibility after the fact to fix photos that might be a little dark or bright. Also, it's not magic. If your exposure is way off, you won't be able to completely fix it. But what about totality? How do you handle that? As soon as you're sure the last bit of sun has disappeared, you take off the filter. If you have a zoom lens, depending on how big of a zoom it is, you'll probably want to zoom out. Depending on where you are, you now have about four minutes of totality.
This part of the eclipse has a unique set of challenges. The outer atmosphere of the sun, the corona, is now visible. However, it's a lot dimmer than even the filtered sun, about 30 times dimmer. It can also extend quite a distance from the sun. On the screen, I'll show some examples of the eclipse sun at a few different zoom levels. These are full-frame equivalent focal lengths. The red loops of gas visible along the sun's edge prominences are much brighter than the corona, but they're still darker than the filtered sun. And this is where a feature called auto exposure bracketing comes in. This is a setting where your camera will take one or more photos darker than what you had the set exposure set to and one or more photos brighter. If you configure it correctly, you push the shutter butter. <laughs> If you configure it correctly, you push the shutter button once and you get three to seven photos depending on your camera and its settings. So this does vary from camera to camera and from company to company, but you should become familiar with the feature ahead of time. Not only does it maximize your chance of getting a perfect exposure, but you'll be able to expose for different parts of the sun's atmosphere. And if you're really fancy, you may be able to combine them to produce an even more dramatic photo. Another thing to look for, in the longer exposures, you should be able to pick up some stars and planets. Just make sure you zoom out for some of those photos. At the very least, you should be able to look for them visually. Venus and Jupiter should be visible during this eclipse. Remember, at this point, you definitely want to use the self-timer on your camera or some kind of remote or app shutter release to avoid shaking the lens. Now we know what equipment we need, how to deal with the partial versus total phases of the eclipse, and what kind of settings we should use. How can we increase our chances of success? Back in my early 20s, I flew to Mexico to see my first total solar eclipse. I brought a camera. They were film cameras back then. I didn't bring a solar filter, so I wasn't able to take photos of the partial phases. I also didn't bring a tripod or any other kind of mount. But really, the biggest issue is I hadn't practiced. I was totally unprepared. I saw an amazing solar eclipse. I did try to take some photos, but when the photos got back from the lab, they sucked. It can be years, if not decades, between eclipses. We don't want to overthink it, but mistakes can happen. How can we possibly prepare ahead of time? Make sure you have solar filters for yourself and your camera. Do what professional photographers do. Make sure you, your batteries are charged and you have plenty of space on your memory cards. Have extra memory cards. If you haven't used a camera in a few years, make sure the batteries are still good and it still works. But really, how can you practice? Take photos of the sun using the filter like I've done in this video. Get used to it. Look at your test photos on a computer to make sure they look good. For the total phases, practice taking photos of the moon. Do both a full moon and a partial moon if possible. Become more familiar with your camera settings. At the very least, you should experiment with combinations of ISO, aperture, and shutter speed to see what values give you a good result. Practice with the moon. If you already have done all that, practice auto exposure bracketing and make sure those images look good on a computer. Zoom in and make sure things don't look blurry or grainy. Some of them might be too bright or too dark, but that's part of the process. And if you have another camera, consider bringing it along. That way you have a backup and you can use it to take environmental photos. For this kind of photo, you can probably leave the camera in auto exposure mode. Just be careful with the shutter speed so it isn't like shaking too much. These kind of photos can really be dramatic, especially if you have a wide angle lens. This photo was taken on a backup camera by my daughter in 2017. If you don't have a backup camera, use your phone for that. And if you're seeing the eclipse with others, have them use the backup camera or their phone. Just make sure everybody has solar glasses. Becoming familiar with your equipment and practicing ahead of time is the most important thing you can do. If you have done all of the above, you will get some great photos of the eclipse, but there's one final step. Live in the moment while the eclipse is happening, and be very careful. Solar eclipses can be addictive. Of course, it's just as I uh, plan on recording this, a huge cloud goes over the sun. Typical. Solar eclipses rule! And I think I've been working on this video too long. <laughs>